Hi, this is Natalie Hoffman of FlyingFreeNow.com, and you're listening to the Flying Free Podcast, a support resource for women of faith looking for hope and healing from hidden emotional and spiritual abuse. Welcome to episode 13 of the Flying Free Podcast. Today, Rachel and I are going to be continuing our discussion from last week where we talked about um, setting boundaries. And today we're going to talk about what happens when you do set boundaries. And so um, just as a recap, last week we talked about what boundaries are. It's basically having your own house and yard. Everyone on Everyone in the world has their very own house and yard that they're in charge of. Your house and yard represents who you are as a person. And crossing boundaries just means when you go over into someone else's house and yard and try to rearrange their flower garden, or when they come over to your house and yard and insist on coming in and rearranging your furniture or redecorating your home in a way that they would like, but you don't like. Um... One of the things I forgot to bring out in last week's session is that the abuse, I think you could even make a case for the definition of abuse being the inability to, uh, or someone's causing you to be unable to maintain your personal boundaries due to the, you know, these outside forces beyond your control. So basically abuse would be someone coming over into your house and yard and taking over for you and, and saying, you have no right to your own house and yard. I will take over all of, all of your, I will, you know, do everything that needs to be done in your house and yard and you will do none of it. Kind of an enmeshment. So anyway, Rachel, hi. 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 <laughs> I'm right. so glad to talk about this. This is so vitally important for healthy relationships. It is. Yes. We talked last week about how this is really the difference between kind of being in a childlike mode where we, where our parents sort of take care of our house and yard until we're an adult. And unfortunately, many people stay in that childlike mode and they always kind of allow other people to take care of their house and yard rather than taking right. over control of their own house and yard. And you'll hear religious, um, you know, religious reasons for that, why that's good or Christian. For example, a lot of people believe, or some Christian people believe that a father should always have control over his daughter's house and yard until she is turned over to her husband and then her husband takes over control of her house and yard. But is that really what the Bible teaches that someone else is going to be accountable for your house and yard, that someone else needs to be taking care or taking responsibility for your house and yard? Is that what God teaches? I don't see that. I don't see it at all. I see people people who, who are responsible for themselves and God holds them accountable um, individual, individually. That, you see that all over the Bible. Yes. Whether, regardless of whether or not you are a male or a female or yeah. whether, what, whatever race you are, um, what your socioeconomic status is, it doesn't matter. You're a human being and you are directly responsible and accountable before God for what you choose to do with the life that he gave you. The life meaning the house and yard that he gave you. Okay? Exactly. Okay. So basically setting boundaries would be, which we talked about last week again, just by way of a recap, is saying that this is where my fence is and this is where I'm in charge of who I'm going to allow into my house and yard and who I'm not going to allow in. And I am also need to respect the houses and yards of other people. So I'm not going to cross over to my neighbor's yard and go over there and say, hey, you know what? You haven't been watering your roses and they're dying. And so I just came over to water your roses for you. Or, hey, you know what? Your roses are dying because they haven't been watered. So you better get, you better get to watering those roses I'm not going to do that because that's their house and yard and they get to do it. Now, if they come over to me, to our fence that divides us and they say, Hey, my roses are dying. Do you have any good ideas for like what I could do to help my roses not die anymore? 
And then I could, they're mm-hmm. giving me an invitation then. So I can look at their rose garden and go, well, you know, they look like they haven't had anything to drink for a long time. Why don't you give them some water? You yeah. know, that's fine. That's fine. But yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you can, <laughs> well, to just expand on that, you can say, why don't you go water them? And, or, Hey, I'm, if they say I'm going to be out of town, would you mind watering them while I'm gone? For this specific amount of time, yeah, go over there and do that. Okay, but, um, yes. all within the, in the boundaries of individual responsibility. Yes. Okay. Now, so so far, now we've been talking in terms of a metaphor. Okay. So we're not really talking. I mean, some of our listeners live in apartments; they don't live in a house with a yard. <laughs> so, and yeah. so we're not talking about that. We're just talking about your house and your yard represent your personhood and who you are as a person, and anything under your jurisdiction that you're responsible for. Okay. So, um, so what happens? So our topic for today is what happens when you set boundaries. Because a problem is that not everybody likes boundaries. And if, you've, if you're coming out of an abusive situation, you've been living with someone who is absolutely not interested in boundaries at all, and you're trying right. to establish them, and maybe you're still living with this person who's not respecting your boundaries. So, how, what, so first of all, um, maybe, Rachel, maybe you could talk about a time when you set a boundary, and then what happened when you did that? And then what was your response to what happened? Right. There were um, hardly any boundaries in my marriage until I started to wake up to what was really going on and put a a diagnosis to it, which was, it was um, tremendously abusive. Um, So I I was trying to figure out what to do. And so I, I, you know, sort of started setting boundaries. And um, I think you know, it started out as, you know, some very minor things and it, he, he kept, um, crossing them, um, because that's what he was used to doing. And and that's what I had allowed him to do for the entirety of our marriage. And I remember it, it got to the point where I realized I've got to go start sleeping in a different space in our house. So I, I remember grabbing my pillow from our bed and, um, he was about, he was getting ready for bed. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to go sleep in the guest room. And there were tears, um, and those tears quickly turned into um, guilt and an accusation that I didn't love him. And so this was one of the most, you know, the most um, hard boundaries I'd ever put down. And um, I felt horrible because I was so accustomed to expressing my love for him by allowing him to do whatever he wanted and to tell me to do what he wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as I've, as I've recovered, I've realized how much, um, you know, that, that whole paradigm has flipped. So my love for him now is expressed in not allowing him to do that anymore because that's not good for him. And I, you know, I, I want to stress, I think there's some, when people start learning how to implement boundaries in their life. I think I know I was confused about, um, what that looks like in everyday situations. And I think a good rule of thumb is boundaries are all about me, what I'm going to do. It's not about imposing punishment on someone else. Um, so like, for example, I was going to go to the other room, not because I, I didn't love him, as I said, or I was trying to, um, get back at him somehow. It was, I have to feel safe and I have to, um, you know, if he can, since he's continued to, to exhibit behavior, um, that is, uh, not in, in step with healthy, a healthy relationship as I'm coming to understand it. Uh, I've got to put some space between us for myself. And so I'm going to, to take what I'm responsible for and, and manage it in this way. Um, and yeah, like I said, it was scary because, um, as I referenced last week, it was, my entire identity was, was wrapped up in what people thought about me and, and the approval I got from other people. So I had, um, thankfully, I had a, a good friend who helped me to stay strong. And I think that's so important when you're learning what boundaries look like in your life, to have someone who can encourage you and just come alongside you and say, 
nope, you're not wrong. You shouldn't feel guilty about this. This is okay. It may feel terrible, but, but, um, but that doesn't mean that it's bad. And so someone that can remind you about that in those moments of pain, when, um, you're first, you're first putting up your fence and, and saying, you can't come in here right now when you're going to act like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that that is important that you have support. Um, another example that I can think of in my own, I actually talk about this in my book. Is it me making sense of your confusing marriage? But we had a situation where um, my ex-husband didn't want me to fill up the gas tank. He wanted to fill it up for me, which sounds really nice, right? <laughs> he um, he had a coupon codes or some, or some kind of coupon thing that, and so he wanted to take it to a certain gas station and fill it up with using this card. And so he asked me not to fill up my car. The only problem is that he would neglect to fill. It wasn't just my car. We had a shared van, okay? The only problem is that he would neglect to keep it filled. So um, it, would run on, it would run low, and then I would have to take the kids somewhere or do something, and it would be really, really low, and I would feel like I couldn't fill it up. I know this sounds dorky, but this is just this is the way my life was. <laughs> so, um, well... So three different times, it takes me a long time to learn things, but so three, <laughs> three different times I ran out of gas in my yeah. effort to honor my husband's wishes. And yeah. all three times God took care of me. It was all three times were precarious situations, you know, cause you, you never know when you're going to run out on gas, out of gas it could be in the freeway. It could be in the middle of track, you know, whatever. So, and I had kids in the car all three times as well. So at the third time, I finally, you know, the first two times I was like, well, I don't want to run out of gas. I'm afraid. I really need you to, if you want to fill it up with your own coupon code and stuff, then I really need you to keep an eye on it so that, but what was happening was I was not taking responsibility. I realized, I mean, I know now looking back, I think what a dork I was just who cares? You know, who cares if he gets mad at you? Just to, yeah. don't run out of gas. So, but well, eventually I got it after the third time I told him, I said, I'm going to be keeping the gas tank filled from now on, on my own. Yeah. And I did. And I never ran, I've never run out. I'd never run out of gas before that. And I've never yeah. run out of gas since that, <laughs> then, but I, I just took ownership of my own life. And even though he was my husband and I was under this thinking that you had to do everything that your husband told you, yeah. um, I finally said, no, I'm not going to be doing that. That's not healthy for me. It's not, I'm putting myself and my kids in danger by doing that. And so I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, there's other ways too, though, that we can, so that's, those are both, you know, examples of how we can set our own boundaries and take responsibility for our own house and yard. But sometimes I think we actually take responsibility for our husbands and maybe their lack, um, like, yeah. um, or we take responsibility for, um, other people in our lives, our friends, and we try to cover for them or we try to make up for, you know, we, and that's actually, we're actually crossing their boundaries. We think that's loving because we're taking care of them, but yeah. it's actually not loving because we're crossing over into their house and yard and taking over for them and trying to, you know, we think that we're helping them out, but all we're really doing is enabling them to not take responsibility for their own lives. And this is not healthy for you. It's not healthy for them. So can, I don't know if you can, can you think of any examples of where you maybe tried to be helpful, but. So and, this is um, an everyday exercise as I learn what it's like to parent a teenager. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> my son is 14 and. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's the effect of being in a, in a really unhealthy environment for most of his life where I, um, you know, I was so accustomed to, um, covering up for his dad and, and also feeling guilty because his dad wasn't, you know, the, his dad wasn't the one, you know, what I had envisioned as, um, someone I wanted to parent, you know, parental co-parent with. And so, um, I think that I'm learning how now to uh, help him to see the responsibility he has in his own life 
uh, but I still, I catch myself and, and it, it's an everyday um, learning process of, of figuring out what does this look like in relationship to him. And um, so like, you know, like he, he needs to make sure that he has clothes for himself instead of me asking like, Hey, how's your laundry situation? Like if he doesn't have the clothes he wants to wear, he's going to learn how to make sure to think ahead um, in order to make, you know, have, have the, have the look that he wants, which is very important <laughs> <laughs> at his age, you know, it's right. a really simple thing, but um, you know, and, old, and I've, I'm also learning too, like, you know, the 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 balance of responsibility and and that he witnessed growing up um was so uneven with with stuff in the house so the the rule in our house was I took care of the inside where my husband took care of the outside which is really convenient because half the year there's hardly anything to do except shovel snow so anyway um that sounded okay but but it really in reality (laughs) didn't turn out that way so I was you know I would really take care of a lot of things inside the house but so learning how to um, make sure that he has, my, my son has um, responsibility. It's okay to, to tell him he needs to go do the dishes and he's going to be upset about that. But that's, um, I mean, yes, that's normal teenage behavior and it's no reflection of me as a parent. That's a really simple um, uh, example, <laughs> but it's, it's, um, it's something I'm still wrestling out with because um, I think for, for women, um, we've talked about this, Natalie women who've been divorced, I think it's easy to feel guilty about, um, you know, the situation that your kids have been in and how, you know, you never ever wanted that. And if you are the one who initiated the actual legal proceedings as I did, it can be even more confusing because you, you know, that was never something you wanted. And so, um, sometimes that guilt can spill over into allowing the kids, um, you know, and the teenagers, um, you know, in, enabling them to be less responsible than really is what's good for them. Mm-hmm. So the book, um, boundaries with teens has been really helpful for me, mm-hmm. um, to see that this is what, um, that love as expressed, um, in teaching him, my love for him expressed in teaching him how to be a healthy adult looks like, cause I really, I didn't have examples of good boundaries growing up. And that was part of the why, part of why, um, I was able to get matched up with my husband because he um, treated me the way I was used to being treated as I'd grown up. So there's just no examples of healthy boundaries in my life. And so I'm having to reparent myself in that way and teach myself an everyday journey. Yep. So when, when we allow other people to come over into our house and yard and then all of a sudden we decide, well, not all of a sudden, but we eventually learn, okay, I need to take care of my own house and yard. And so I need to ask these people to all leave now. You guys can all go, go take care of your own house and yard. Usually what happens is those people, they're used to controlling you. They're used to telling you what to do. They're used to you meeting their needs. That would be you in their house and yard. There's a lot of enmeshment and a lot of crossing over of boundaries. Okay. Yeah. And when you decide, when you actually establish those clear boundaries around yourself, you start taking care of yourself. You start letting them go. You know, if you stop taking care of their rose garden, you start taking care of yours. That then these pe- people tend to get upset about that. Yeah. They don't like that yeah. you're upsetting the status quo. You're changing things up. The relationship dynamics are going to change. And, um, it is going to be extremely uncomfortable. It's, there's a, it's a double whammy because you're already, like you described, you're feeling guilty. You're not really sure. Is this really what I should be doing? And then you've got this person who's mad at you and they're kind of trying to reinforce that guilt and, and, you know, blame you when things fall apart, when their rose garden is no longer blooming because you're not over there fixing it for them or, um, or when they're feeling rejected because you won't let them come over and do whatever they want to do, um, they're going to be upset and that's going to, that's going to be hard. So, but it's necessary. And I was thinking when you were talking about the kid thing, one of the things that I, I run into this with my kids all the time, they'll have a fight between, you know, two kids will have a fight and they'll want me to fix it. 
They'll want me to be the, you know, the arbitrator and fix it. And a lot of times, these are older kids. Okay. These aren't little kids. We're not talking about two and three-year-olds. We're talking about, you know, like 13 and 15 year olds. Okay. Mm -hmm. My stand now is it's not really my job to fix the fight between you two. So it's usually somebody is being mean to the other one. And I try to teach them boundaries where I say, if someone is crossing into your yard and, and painting, you know, slapping on red paint all over your house, then you need to, you need to get away from that person. Okay. Yeah. They, they might not stop. They might keep, well, this, that's where the this illustration. The house and Alan doesn't work. You can't move the yeah. house. Okay. Let's go. Let's do this one. Um, if you're sitting next to somebody and they keep kicking you in the shin. Yeah. Yeah. And you say, can you please stop? That hurts. And they just kind of look at you and keep kicking. What can you do at that point? Right. Get up and move. Right. And then, so my kid will say, well, that's not fair. I wanted to stay in the chair. I shouldn't have to get up and move. They need to stop kicking. Well, you're right. It's not fair. It's not fair that the kicker keeps getting to kick. But you know what? We cannot control other people. We can't control a kicker. A kicker is a kicker. And if you don't want to be kicked, don't hang out with kickers. Yeah. Uh, And it's not fair. Exactly. It's not fair. You want to inhabit that space where the kicker is, but you're not going to be able to. You need to find a separate space. Yep. It's really hard because it isn't fair. And, and it's uh, for all the work that we put in and all the, the love and, and, and you know, long suffering we, we um, devoted to our marriages. You know, like, like I said earlier, I was the one who initiated the divorce proceedings. I had to get up and move away from the kicker. Mm-hmm. And, um, cause he wasn't going to do it. He had a great setup. He was enjoying it. <laughs> That's the way he, he wanted it. Uh, so yeah, it's not fair, <laughs> but it's what you have to do. It's your responsibility. If, if, if that's, um, if you choose to live in truth and in reality instead right. of, um, you know, and saying no more. Right. Some typical responses from, if we bring this back to just in the home and dealing with abuse from a intimate partner, they're going to they're going to blame you they're going to get very angry with you they're going to possibly spread lies about you they're going to yeah. they're going to accuse you of being mean we talked at yeah. the very beginning of the last episode about how people think that setting boundaries is mean they think that if you have a boundary you're being mean here's a great example um um, people might ask you to do something for, for them and you might all, you might be really, really busy. Okay. Let's say that you've got a bit jam packed week and you have just almost no margin or downtime. Yeah. And there's this one evening that in the entire week you have one night free and you were going to kind of use that night to just recover and recuperate. But somebody comes along, maybe a friend comes along and says, I really need you to do this thing that night. And you say, no, Mm -hmm. they might, they, if this is, if they're used to getting what they want from you there, they might be saying, well, why, why not? Don't you have that night free? And you might be feeling guilty and be thinking, well, I do have that night free, but It's the only night free that I have. And if you've been taught that you need to die to yourself and, you know, you need to be unselfish and you need to be giving and you need to be doing ministry 24 seven, then of course you're going to feel super, super guilty. If you say no, you're going to feel like you have to say yes. This is, this is what we're talking about. This is boundaries. This is where you say, you know, my rose garden needs some watering, but it also needs some sunshine and I'm going to, and it also needs some rest and I'm going to give, I'm going to give myself some rest that night and I don't have to meet everybody's needs. And maybe there's another way that this person could get their need met and it doesn't have to be me. So, you know, and it's funny because Jesus wasn't in ministry 24 seven. He, um, we've talked about this, but he, you know, he went off to rest. He would flee from the multitudes of people who wanted something from him. They, you know, he obviously, um, 
was was the light in that world. And so people were attracted to that light. But yet he would go off to recharge his light um, right. from, you know, time with his father and time with rest and, and time for prayer, et cetera. So yeah. I think we need to be, be modeling that in our own lives as well and using the gifts that God has given us, um, stewarding them wisely, which includes both using them and recharging them. Yes. I had one, I had recently had, uh, there's a lady that I know, um, who is going through chemotherapy and cancer and, um, she was really burnt out on her life. Just everything was, she is an extremely compassionate, kind, caring, loving, you know, one of the most loving people that you could probably ever meet. But because of that propensity that she had to want to help everybody, she was literally burning the candle at both ends. And she realized when she ended up getting cancer, she realized, you know, that obviously put everything at a stop. She was no longer able to be the person who was giving, giving, giving. Now she was in this position of having to accept help from other people. And it's yeah. very difficult to do when you're in the when you're used to just giving, but it's also caused her to just step back and realize, wow, when I do get done with the chemotherapy, how am I going to live my life differently? What kind yeah. of protections am I going to put up around myself? What kind of margin am I going to build into my life? Um, at one point, I I brought her a meal, and she said, I don't know that I would have had time to bring anybody a meal because I don't. I didn't have any margin. There was no margin in my life. Yeah. And so yeah. You I don't bring meals to everybody who needs a meal either. I that's just mm-hmm. my you know, I can't do that because I have to yeah. have margin in my life. But but if we have some built-in margin in our lives and we're taking good care of our, those boundaries for ourselves, we have spaces where we can do cartwheels. We have spaces yeah. where we don't feel hemmed in and closed in by all of the demands that are around, that are on our lives. And, yeah. and cause we have to, everyone has got a limited number of hours in their life and you have to, you have to figure out how you're going to use those hours, not just to take care of the, the other people in your life, like your children, or if you're married, your spouse, but how to take care of yourself so that yeah. you can actually then turn around and in from a place of strength and health and um whatever that you can help other people from that place rather than a place of just t- total and utter exhaustion, burnt <laughs> out and guilt. Yeah. Like who wants to help out of guilt anyways? That's just such a growth. Well, see, it's not truthful. You know, right. you're giving this to someone, but but your heart isn't there. You're sort right. of resenting, you know, the fact that, you know, it took took away from these other things. Yep. So it's it's really not truthful. And um what I hear you describing, Natalie, is actually boundaries with yourself. Because you may be divided about what your desires are. You know, you desire to go out and make meals for every chemo patient in the, you know, in the Twin Cities or whatever, but it's just not possible. Yep. And um so you realize, well, I am going to have some boundaries with myself and, and say no to that desire and um, make this meal for my one friend out of the authenticity authenticity of, of our my love for her and our relationship and my care for her and do it with a completely loving and cheerful heart out of right. the space that I have for her in my life. Right. So what I'm hearing you describe too is just understanding your own limits, understanding where your fence yeah. stops. Exactly. I don't yeah, have exactly. the ability to do any more than what's within my house and yard. Yeah, it's just it's such a yes. very freeing to feel it like is. I have all of these, all of this opportunity here, and I don't have to extend, my, overextend myself, and I also don't have to take control of other people and control their lives, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I also don't have to let them control my life. I get to decide. So I think we'll wrap it up right there. I think that's a good ending yeah. point. And it, so anyway, worth it. they're worth the, the, the pain, the guilt, um, the insecurity that you feel as you're learning to establish these and what it looks like in your life. And it's not going to be perfect. You may, you may accidentally cross into someone else's boundaries or not do it the right way, but just keep, keep practicing and ask God to, um, to guide you and his Holy Spirit um, as you're figuring all this out. And there's so much grace. Yes. Yes. 
All right. Thanks, Rachel, for joining me today. And for the rest of you, fly free.